Hi, my name is Sonia Blade, um, and welcome to my introduction to ball gown making 101. Uh, this panel is meant for just beginning tips and hopefully can get you started on your uh, first ball gown or if you want to just improve it in certain techniques. Um, I've been sewing for about four years, been making ball gowns for about one. Um, so there is maybe gaps of knowledge that I don't know about. So if you have something that you know how to do better or um, maybe there are different types of techniques. There's 20,000 ways to get to one destination. So you can put into the comments or things like that, but these are tips and tricks that I can help you guys out that I've learned in the past year and a half. And um, after making a couple of ball gowns, I've kind of like tested the waters of what's good and what's not good. And um, I'm always willing to learn. So just, uh, just, um, just a disclaimer. So this is more so, this panel is meant to be more so not like it, um, a step-by-step -step guide as far as like how to truly take it like with stitching and machine stitching it's more so a guide of just kind of like the things that you need what research you can do and um like what can be helpful to you so if you're looking for like a specific type of ball gown um this panel should help you just generally kind of get the idea um but there are other tutorials for like a specific type of ball gown so if you want to do um something similar to my bell gown <coughs> that i made um there's other tutorials for that like uh let down your hair has a beautiful bell gown sort of like exactly step by step like what you use and things like that's so one i use for one um so i just want to get started into it and just go over a couple things and we're just gonna start from the top and I'm gonna i just want to start so that's the thing i want to say um thank you guys for watching in advance and i hope you guys enjoyed this video and also leave comments of things i can improve if you like this maybe i'll make more in the future but uh first time to try right okay anyways so i just want to talk about so when you're making your ball gown your very very first ball gown it can be intimidating and i know it can be intimidating because i was intimidated so i just want to let you know that it's okay to be scared but i'm here to help you <laughs> along the way and at least get you set up for a start of success so so when you're thinking about making a ball gown it's really important to understand that yes Ball gowns are fun, they're beautiful, they can make you feel great, they can make you feel like royalty, things like that, but they do take a lot of time. So you need to make sure you manage your time well before you get into this whole endeavor of a ball gown. Uh, my bell ball gown took me about six weeks and that was really pushing it. Um, if I had to determine the timeline that I would like to take and just kind of take my time, put all the embellishments I wanted into it, I would like to at least have like two to three months. Um, to make like a full ball gown from like bought from scratch from not having anything um, from scratch to the top. So now that I have things, um, cages, multiple cages, which is currently cages um, and hoop skirts, uh, it might take me a little bit less longer as well as I have my stays already made um, that can be replicated for multiple multiple types of gowns, multiple types of gowns. It might take me a little longer. For, for a person who has like nothing, like absolutely nothing, I really recommend you take at least two months to start planning out, maybe more, start planning out your ball gown. Um, so when we're talking about ball gowns, we, there's so many. So really you need to determine what type of ball gown that you're looking for. What type of ball gown do you want? Like what is the end goal for you? Is it something like my belt where you have that like round crinoline shape? So then maybe you need to start looking into 1850s fashion and start looking there. Um, maybe you want the, <clears throat> these like sec, I think it's called a sec back gown, where they have like the large mirrors on the side. So it's like more centered, that hoop skirt is more centered like this, but it's, when it's from side to side, it's completely flat. So there's a thing you need to consider. It's like what age, what range are you going with? A lot of ball gowns come from some type of fashion history. It's some type of historical aspect to it. Most of them do, or most of them have influences. So I really recommend that you go back and like research, like what type of gown is this? And the type of ball gowns, like research into it so that way you can have a better understanding on what you need and what, and what type of structures that you're going with. Um, I highly recommend, you know, researching. One of my favorite books right now is um, 18th Century Dressmaking. Uh, it has a lot of good uh, historical background so you can see like what people use and like how it was constructed if you're going for a more historical aspect of uh, gown making so maybe renaissance fair things like that reactions 
books like these are really good. So I'll link this in the description below. But fantastic. Um, it has definitely fantastic imagery. Uh, like what is in it, as well as like how to make the underwear, things like that, and what and what uh, type of book. So I highly recommend I highly recommend that type of book. Um, so just research those things. And so like and also I recommend so once you figure it out. So once you figured out what type of gown that you want, the type of gown that you need, maybe it's for a competition, maybe it's for yourself, maybe it's just for photo shoots, things like that. I recommend making a mood board. Making a mood board will really like set the expectations for you. You know, it gives you the feel. Um, and I can show you an example here. Uh, of my mood board for my belt. My belt was more, I wanted to make it a little bit more special. I wanted to put more detail into it. And I'm glad I did. I could have put more, but uh, it just helped set out like what I was looking for, what fabric types and things like that. So I highly recommend like doing a mood board. Like what's the, you know, the effect that you want for yourself? What is the mood essentially you want for yourself for this uh, dress that you're making? So that way like you know, like you can have like a clear vision of where you're going or at least a semi-path versus kind of like being scared. It's like, I don't even know where to start. Starting with a mood board, starting with what type of gown you will have at the end of it is the start. Um, okay. So going into it, hopefully the, that kind of sets the tone for y'all. And it, in a sense of just kind of like, it's okay to be afraid, but it's also okay to, like, here's where the plan is. So first, like, first thing first is like, what type of dress am I going to make? Am I going to make this really big dress? Am I going to make um, a dress that for my, like I have my Anastasia, so it's like business in the front, party in the back, which that dress will be, I will be using that dress for demonstrations today and things like that. So that's where we're going to start. What type of dress do you make? I want to talk about supplies that you're going to need, what things you might need, and we're going to kind of go into like a demonstration and break everything down like one by one essentially that's what i want to show you today so um, i have my trusty dress form here um i highly recommend that you have a dress form for the for making ball gowns um for the reason of like, it just helps you with leveling helps you with seeing it all all at once um it's just good just invest if you are our plus size i recognize that there it's really hard to find plus size patterns uh plus size Body forms in general, but I recommend, especially if you're kind of like me, where you're kind of in between plus size, so if you're not really that small, but you're also not really that big, um, getting a, um, getting a, a dress form that's as close as you can get it to your waist, and then padding it out. I don't have any pads on it currently, because it's not needed for, at least for the bottom, um, but padding it out. There are padding systems there for you that you can buy. You can buy like a small dress form and then just pad it out. The padding systems are anywhere from like $20 to $50 depending on the type of brand that you buy. Um, so you can pad it out. So if you need bigger hips, like really bigger hips, uh, uh, room for a tummy, for a booty, things like that, these um, can help you, you can attach them. Some of them are Velcro, some of them you have to pin on. Um, but those are things that you can use and then they usually come with a t-shirt so you can put it all over it by itself so but if you're like me also just making sure that, like this one doesn't really have a bust it doesn't have boobs this basic one so i recommend that my boobs are short this just but um i recommend that if you do get a dress form that you um put a bra into a bra that you don't care about anymore that you're never going to use um and then stuff you with polyfill or whatever stuffing so that way at least you will have like a better idea of what your bust is going to look like um so that <laughs> my boobs aren't that big but big enough bigger than this so um so it just gives you a better idea and this is pretty much what i generally use for my ball gowns because my waist is about the same maybe a little bit bigger but probably a lot bigger um it's about the same but um i made my waistbands for everything to be multiple so i make it bigger if i get smaller so number one thing get a dress form invest in dress forms they are not cheap but if you find a used one get that i got this off of facebook marketplace for like 40 dollars um some of them sell like more expensive just 
I highly recommend just getting one. This one's an adjustable one. It's not my favorite, but it works. $40, it will do. Um, yeah, so dress form is like the first thing you can get invest in a dress form. And honestly, it will help you with patterning. It will help you with your future projects. It's just an investment in general if you're really into the hobby. Okay. Things I want to talk about next for once you've figured out the gown that you are making, now it's time to talk about the con underneath the construction. The things that people don't see are what are what is going to make your gown amazing. So um, we're going to talk about underwear first and undergarments that you uh, typically use. So first up would be a chemise. And I'm going to be testing, I'm going to be using my Anastasia gown, I think I mentioned it before, um, as demonstration purposes, so <sighs> there's already stuff on here. But um, what I do want to talk about is the chemise. So your chemise, or you can use the cami, I've seen other people use camis, it's going to be your, your first layer. And a chemise is kind of like a smock, it's just kind of like this really formless gown. Like it looks similar to a nightgown, um, and what that's really meant for is to collect your sweat because a lot of these need um, you won't have the time. Or back in in the past, a lot of people didn't have time. A lot of people did not wash their garments every day and things like that. So you want the, your first layer to want <coughs> be comfortable because when you start putting on all these layers, um, it starts getting heavy and you'll start sweating on these layers. Um, it's going to be heavy and you're going to start sweating. So you want the chemise to be there to gather, to basically give you like a protection and a nice layer. And it's going to make you comfortable with things like that. I love my chemise. I don't have one currently. Um, it got stained and so I'm making a new one. But um, you can also wear a cami. Some people wear camis as an option as well. Um, if you don't want to wear a chemise. But if you want the whole shebang, the whole historical fashion shebang, a chemise um, would be neat. Uh, then you want to go put your either pretzels, bloomers, or draws, whatever you choose to call them. All of them are the same thing. Um, so this is my pair of pair of draws, pair of bloomers. I call them bloomers. Um, they're really cute. They have a little scalp edge at the end of it. Um, so that's, those are those. Um, but uh, I do put them on next. And again, it's a, just a general, like, depending on the period you're in, it's just a general thing that you would wear because I do like wearing them because when you're walking around um, uh, the event, you're going to most likely um, hold your gown while you're walking around. So you, you get a chance to kind of show off the bloomers and whatever your tights are and things like that. Well, maybe not too much, but uh, depending on the ankle. Um, <laughs> people will see you coming around, but it's nice. I know people do wear leggings with their ball gowns, things like that. So those are options for you. If you don't want to make bloomers, if you want to make bloomers, usually the type of fabrics that you can use are like cotton linen, things like that, especially, and also for the chemise. Linen is also acceptable. Cotton is also acceptable or something um, very comfortable. I made both my um, bloomers and chemise out of bed sheets. Um, very comfortable, just so it's like nice and comfy. And honestly, I like to be around in them, but to be quite honest, just, Lazing around, they're so soft. Um, I'm gonna use those shoes, but um, that's an option for you again. You can either buy a chemise, which is generally like a smock or like a what's the word? What's the word? Smock, drape. It's something just kind of like a just a long neck gown. That's also you can buy it as well. Um, not too sure if you can buy a full cotton one. Maybe not like a satin one just for the corset so it doesn't slip and slide. Things like that, that would be cool. Uh, so next, um, I did it off camera. So uh, next would be your corset or your stays, uh, depending on the time period you're talking about. It could be interchangeable. Um, both of them generally mean the same thing, generally, unless you're talking about a specific type of corset. Now I'm gonna link a couple of resources that you guys can use at books or youtubers other things that can talk about making your first corset and also where to buy i know a lot of people use orchid corset as a place to buy buying corsets is also a good it is a like if you're buying corsets it's fine um you are going to be spending a lot on your corsets and things like that um just uh i think orchid corsets are like 80 dollars 80 to 100. um <clears throat> I would recommend like spending the money on like your undergarments and things like that. 
um, because those are the things that are going to last you and you can wear them underneath multiple gowns. Um, and also since you are wearing um, essentially body shape wear, that the corset is going to make you have a certain body shape, it's best to have a good type of um, structure and not too flimsy. So one, it doesn't harm you and two, it can last longer. I do have like a cheaper shapewear of sorts. Um, there are like 10, 12, I bought it on Amazon for 20 bucks. It gets the job done. It's uncomfortable for me to wear, but it does get the job done for an hour photo shoot. Um, but if I'm wearing something all day, I prefer to have corset or some type of stays. That one I can breathe in too. It's, it is generally comfortable for me to wear all day, but that's just the whole shebang. So this is my corset. I did wear this for Anastasia. Um, it's made out of koto and a fashion fabric on top. It's on a bias tape and it has um, spiral steel boning as well as split bust in the front. The split bust is really important because um, I can at least get this on by myself. I don't need help. I would appreciate help, but I don't need help. I can usually get this on myself. Um, it's faster when you have someone in the back um, pulling the string so it's like tightening around so it's easier for you to get out by yourself but the split bus was invented so you could so it would be easy so you would need a maid um to put it by yourself so it does have a split bus in the middle it does have the spot as far as stay bones and things like that I'm sure. so this is what is you're going to be after your chemise and after your boomer you're going to put on um your <clears throat> corset here's where i recommend that you put on your shoes you can put on your shoes any other way, but I recommend if you get everything else in so your socks and everything, I recommend you put on your shoes next because after this, it's going to be a little bit more difficult for you to bend over and tie your shoes or put your shoes on and things like that. Put on your shoes. As soon as you get all the undergarments on, put on your shoes. Um, there are different styles, of course, that you can use. It really, again, it depends on what your final gown is going to be like. For me, this type of corset, which is actually the Civil War, Air pattern that I got, I'll link it in the description below. Um, it's a perfect corset for me to use just for this type of situation. Um, so again, it really depends on what type of gown you're using. Um, it depends on the corset that you need. So if you're looking for more of a Victorian or like the bustle era and then Edwardian, so where it has like the pigeon bust, um, the corsets like um, <laughs> if you're doing like an Edwardian corset for a certain type of gown where like the awarding corsets is different. I can talk about corsets a different day, but awarding corset, just to give you an example, it's more so it pushes the bust together. So you have this pigeon bust. So you kind of look like this, I guess. It's more so it, it gives you that stretch. And depending on what you're looking for, that may be what you want. So it really just depends again, the effect that you want to go to. And all these garments will affect the final outcome. So that's why they're very important to invest in. Uh, so on to the next, you put on your bloomers, you put on your, um, you put on your chemise, you put on your corset, we're all, we're all sitting, you put on your shoes, put on your shoes. Um, then where the most fun part of me, for me, is the cage. Here's one of them. So this one is a walking cage kind of one. Um, again, I just wanted the effect of my ball gown for this one to be business in the front, party in the back type of style. I noticed a lot of other Anastasia's uh, for the final Kremlin um, were using that kind of stuff, so I just mimicked what they did. Now with the look of it, you don't have to. Um, again, you don't have to do what everyone's doing. You can also just do whatever the heck you want. And we're back. Um, so uh, the next step of your course, uh, depending on what your style is going to change the type of uh, cage that you need. So <clears throat> my Anastasia, uh, this is the cage I needed. I know it's not a full view, but it is the walking cage crinoline kind of from Truly Victorian. I can link it in the description below. Um, this type of cage is what I wanted again. Business in the front, party in the back, because I wanted that silhouette that when I saw others, Anastasia's doing, as well as it's very similar to the live action Cinderella 
uh, movie and it's honestly it was the best decision I made but so having that there or if you want that bell shape they also have like the front page filling as well so again it just give you an idea and now I stuck a pillow behind you just because like I kind of got got some junk but this is what it generally would look like and so and this is why you're going to want this is why you want a dress store so when you can see this so you can see like the effect that it can give and so to make a cage is very simple it's not a difficult garment to make or a difficult piece to make it is an expensive piece to make so you will need um for these hoops right here um you can either use and you can move them around as well like they're not well, yeah. this one's bad. Okay, um these ones are it's a little bit more difficult but um, to move my other round one my round cranoli cage is easy to move like the the ribbons so you will need cross grain ribbon webbing for your waistband or you can do uh what i've seen is that people have some sort of cotton in and make a, like a semi corset and make tile like that which is very pretty in my opinion and then for the bag on the bottom of here yeah um the this is called the bag and there are one two three four four bones in here as well four channels so you will need it and this is broad cotton cotton it's very simple um the cross green ribbons are going down here as well as there's steel bone in here. You will, you know, some people are gonna ask, like, he needs any other type of thing. I wouldn't recommend, like, the, I wouldn't recommend it. If you if you have experience with long ground making, you know that there is a cheaper way than hoop steel boning, then by all means, you can use that. Um, I've only used hoop steel for both of my cages, and they, the reason why I have hoop steel is because my um, fabric choices are so heavy. So, so I really need a a case that's gonna withstand withstand the weight of the ball gown and make sure it doesn't move out. Of this. So this is me. the cages, and this is the basic structure of what you're gonna need. This right here. This is what your underneath should look like at this point, and this is how you get around. Um, these are very easy to sit in. They they move. They're not. I know a lot of people are probably like wondering, like, how do you sit? Um, I kind of sit just normally, like probably on my side a little bit, just for like, I don't sit with a radical crown kind of like cage, I just sit normally, but for the most part, you just sit. Um, these ones are hands, these bones are hand stitched to the channels. Oh, and also the channels here, they are bi-safe. I recommend like bone casing, which is a little bit more sturdier, um, but you can use bi-safe as bone casing or ribbon, or just general ribbons, sorry, honestly. Um, and then I have webbing here with a parachute clip uh, to keep it up. So those are things I recommend. <clears throat> Again, every everyone will have their own. Now, if you're talking about like, um, there's also like a hoop skirt. Essentially, these are kind of like gauges, um, and hoop skirts don't give the. At least not in my experience. They, they work, but not. They don't give the 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 woof, the swish that I really needed for uh, me. My personal thing is it doesn't really matter. So if you wanna go with the hoop cranial cage, that's perfectly fine. They're cheaper to buy online for like 20 bucks. Um, again, always you can buy them. But if you're buying a cranial cage, it might be a little bit more expensive. Um, just because the material is not so expensive. Um, but yeah, for the most part, it's really simple. Virtual Victorian, you'll have your bone channel set. They have a pattern there for you and instructions on how to do it. So these are things. These are things that will give your gown shape. Um, so you will need. So next, after you've done all this, make sure you have your shoes on. If you didn't put on your shoes on before, make sure you put your shoes on now. This is how this works. I guarantee you, you will thank me later. Put on your shoes. Um, at this point. Ugh. Right. coat can be multiple types of fabrics there's also different ways there's also different just things um so i have two organs of credit coats and currently i'm making a common tiered one um it's just a different effect but um you can make your petticoats out tool Arganza or netting. Netting is the strongest out of all of them. It's also the most stiffest and it doesn't move that much. But if you're making something like a tutu or really stiff, maybe a secozo, sec I don't 
means uh, pronunciation, if you're making something that just needs to stay and you really don't care about the flowiness of it, then maybe a net, uh, <laughs> net will work for you. Um, if you want something really soft, really pretty, it will work for you as well. And your organza is somewhere in the middle. It's not as, it's not as stiff and it's not as flowy as tools, kind of in the middle and it will, it gave me, will give you like the strength you need for the cloth of the petticoat and as well as it, it flows beautifully. Um, really, you really do need a petticoat to go on top of this. Do not put it, if you put the skirts on top of it without the petticoat, um, it can show the lines of it and it also is not as big as you need it to be. So we're going for cupcake size in my room, just humongous, just part the Red Sea type of huge, um, very regal type of changes. It's because I don't have a really good lighting system. Um, and the, you know, I've lost some light. So hopefully you guys can still see, so sorry for the poor quality of lights. Um, but on to petticoats. So this petticoat in particular is an organic petticoat and it's layered. Layered is not the word I want to use. Um, it has about essentially four layers, but there's only two layers sewn into the waistband to reduce bulk. Um, I know you can't see all of it, but it's quite quite massive for the lots of ruffles. There are godets on the first layer that build up, so they're like four tiers of godets, um, and that's just to give it bulk, uh, less bulk, but still full. Um, so this is all of organza and it's sewn with overlock stitching um, and a cutter and ruffling and pretty much all over it and with the waistband, it's a cotton waistband that has like a closure at the back. Um, but this is my petticoat for this particular gown um, and this just really gives it more fluff than, me, uh, than it wants to be. Um, with with my bell gown, that's a tiered petticoat. So it's a four tiered petticoat. Um, essentially, you're just going to four petticoat measurements and I'll link, um, I'll link um, a research you can use for petticoat math because petticoat math is really important. Um, you want to make sure that the waistband is good enough and that it bells out to what it needs to be. For tiered petticoats, basically, if you start with the first tier, which should be about two yards all around, and then double it for the rest of the tiers. So the first tier should be two yards, and then the next tier should be four yards of fabric that you're gonna need. The next tier should be eight, and then 16 yards. And they should be continuous as you go on because you're going to gather the ruffles into it. And then you can do as many layers as you want. I did a six layer tiered petticoat, which was difficult. So I preferred this now technique of Godet's. Um, you can also use a ruffled tiered petticoat um, that gives you more, it doesn't give you as much floof, but it does give you enough floof, if that makes sense. Um, you just really need to know about what the amount of floof that you want, and that will get you up. But you do need a petticoat of some sort. Again, you can buy petticoats, but petticoats like this, I don't know if you can buy, you might be able to buy the tiered ones, but I'm not sure about the, like, organs or, or netting like this. This one's kind of like a make your own, but this was a competition piece, so it's not the greatest, but um, it's a learning experience and I will link as many um, petticoat tutorials as I can for you, but they're not a lot of, they're not a lot of them out there. I will admit that. The information on petticoats is really um, rough as tonight, but this is a similar petticoat style for the Cinderella block of action, so that is what I followed and it worked out pretty well. I really like the style of this petticoat, so it just gives it. It gives it that amount of oof that it needs without being ridiculously too much. Um, but you can still sit in it and keep in mind the heavier your top fabric be, just in mind that it can your petticoat can collapse underneath it. Um, so just keep in mind the type of fabric that you will use because it may like squish it and just um, it may squish it and weigh it down. So that's an that is a um, that's an advice I can give you, but petticoats usually you can buy for shorter. Um, organza knitting tool is an option, and then you can have the cotton tier petticoat, which I can put a link for it. So I think that's like a, a some type of visualization here. Um, but tier petticoat is also an option. So those are petticoats that you will, would want to use for your ballgowns.
Yeah. So moving on to the skirt. <laughs> Uh, so now we have the skirt. So this skirt, particularly this one, is uh, polyester Dupani. Um, you could also get Silk Dupani, but I got polyester. One, it's cheaper. Um, two, it's easier to dye. Um, but this is polyester Dupani. It's the type of fabric that you can use any type of, most of the time you can use any type of fabric on like the skirt bodices. So, and this is draped. There is no pattern for this. I just draped it and prayed. Um, I just know what I want it like and where I wanted it to be and how much it would go in. So because it's it's a whole skirt. So there's a skirt underneath and then there's a skirt right here. Um oh, it's okay. Petticoat. And then now you're gonna put on your skirt. And so your skirt should have the same silhouette as your cage and things like that. So if again, this is a very business in the front, party in the back. So the the drape is longer in the can I turn? Oh, Ooh, it's hard to turn. But it's longer in the back than it is the front. So you can just do this. Yeah, can you do this? You can do this. Okay. Um, so it's longer in the front, it's longer in the back. So, and it also has a waistband, and this has closures in the back of it. It's just not, my dress forms a little bit smaller than I am, but it's fine. Um, and it's closures in the back. So it does, it is a, not like a super heavy fabric, but it does weigh down a little bit, but you can still get the poof. But you can see what I mean, right? Like it is like, without it, you saw like the massive amount of poof and with the, with the skirts on it, it just crushes it a little bit, but it's fine because the structure of the cage is always there. So that's what's very important. But uh, fabrics that you can use for um, ball gowns are like, again, polyester dupani, taffeta, satin, um, you can do another tool on top of it, tool, um, organza, things like that. Things that are lightweight. I know a lot of people, you can use a brocade if you want to. Brocade is heavy, it's more heavier. Velvet is also really heavy, so just be mindful of that. You can use whatever you want as far as your skirt fabric goes. Um, things that I probably wouldn't recommend are something like stretch pleather, um, latex, things probably like that I wouldn't recommend, but you want to get like a whole linen, I mean, I guess it, it just really depends on the effect you're trying to get it and um, you're trying to give. So I probably, yeah, for maybe not leather, for like a skirt fabric, especially if you want something like this. Um, you can have leather accents, I think, but not for like a full skirt. I think it would be way too heavy. Or like leather, like stretch feather, something that kind of looks like, it doesn't have, it needs to have like some type of like structure and like some type of non drape if that makes sense. Um, but this is pretty much it. It's, you can look up, like there are plenty of ball gown patterns for you to look up and then you can just like copy it um, directly, the pattern directly. And I can link some, uh, I know Angela Clayton has a, a bunch of like beautiful uh, uh, patterns that I'm very excited for her. I've been following her for a while, but I know she has a bunch of patterns that are good for like historical gown dressing and things like that. Um, yeah. So that is the skirt part. Um, here we go. Here's the bodice. We have 10 minutes. Okay, cool. Um, so be mindful when you are making your chemise, the type of style that you want to make, because it should not be visible from the front. Um, just keep mindful of that. Um, and that's why you should put it also on the dress form so you can see where everything lays, as well as your corset as well in the back. I think I made a mistake in the past where um, my old my old bell bottoms was not, because again, I was in a rush, um, but it was not as high in the back to cover the corset, so the corset was showing. Um, so I, when I redo the bell, I will make sure that the, um, that the fabric is good for it. So, um, but this one is, this fabric is really nice. It's off the shoulder, modified um, with sheer sleeves. Um, but again, all of this is polyester dupani. So when you're coming to your like thick corseted bodices, um, I prefer to corset everything. Corset, 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 corset. Three times I can't say corset and one ten for having everything corseted. Um, just because if if you know when you change size or you can wait, you can still wear it, and you can just have a um, in the back so that way even if you are do gain weight. Um, 
and like spread this way, you can still like put that modesty down on the back and it still can look beautiful just from the back as well. Um, so this is the full closure. Um, but th those are the things, I just prefer it and it's a lot easier to get into and it looks pretty from the back. Um, cause you also just want to look gorgeous, you know, gorgeous from the front and from the back. Uh, so those are things like that. This one, I would recommend that you, so this one's screen, it is also bone. It's not, you cannot see it on the outside, the stitching on the outside because there are so many layers within this corset. So there are about four, four. There are about four layers in the bodice, in this uh, bodice as well. So there's the lining layer. There is the structure layer, which is canvas or duck cloth. I used either or. Uh, you can use either or. Then there's a flannel layer, so it's kind of like a softer, and then there's the fashion layer on top. Now all the construction is underneath with it, all the other layers. So um, there are more bones in here. If you touch it, you can feel it. Um, there are, it is bones um, with whale boning, which is not, it is, according to my knowledge, it's a step above like the rigging and boning that you can get at your local Joann's or Michael's or just your local fabric store, but like a step below steel. Um, and I didn't, you don't, I didn't need steel boning because the corset should already be doing the, most of the work. The corset underneath should already be pulling me in so I can have this nice shape here. So that way you don't need it. So whale boning is a perfect option. Um, you can also use, uh, people can use the ties. That's also a good substitute as well. Use, they're a little bit stronger than the uh, regular bone. But also regular bone is also good. Like all of it's good. It's just, it's just dependent on the strength you want, the resources you have, and where you're going. So this is boned. Yeah, it's just, uh, it's just a structure bonus. And I modified this and I did uh, a mock-up of it on my dress form. And that's pretty much it. Any type of, what I recommend is that you don't use, um, try to stay away from like super, super, super cheap satin, um, if you can help it. Just because they don't, they won't, so definitely have ripped a seam before because it was too tight on my thing, on my stuff. So just try to do like, yeah, polyester if you're fine. Taffeta is also acceptable. Satin is also acceptable. Um, suede, velvet, things like that. Just be mindful because a bodice is a bodice. It's really, but you shouldn't put too much stress on it and just make sure you're doing everything. Yeah, that's not a good thing. Um, fabrics I recommend for bodices would be like taffeta, um, polyester dupani or silk dupani, um, things like that on that same level. Suede, um, again, dresses that I wouldn't, or like fabrics that I wouldn't consider that be good for, that would be good for, um, bodice making maybe like, again, like stretch leather or something like that. Maybe put the accents, but I don't think like a full, like latex live would be the greatest. Um, I do like stretch on mousse just because it does give a little like extra tug. And so, but you just want to make sure that everything is like nice and stiff and um, it flows very beautifully all together. Um, but yeah, that's how you create a ball gown from top to scratch, or at least like the general premise of it. Um, as well, I don't have any else. In construction really is, it's just like the figuring out what you want to do. Um, figuring out like the side you want to do and then building up from inside out. Um, having Making sure that you're doing a lot of mock-ups. If you're working with a lot of expensive fabric, I know some of us hate mock-ups. I hate mock-ups, I really do. But um, I usually do like store-bought patterns and then tailor as I go. Um, and this, with this uh, particular gown, I drew it for the first time. So it was, it was fun, you just kind of, go um everyone has their own method of sewing so but with certain things i would like just you know i just want to hit on that i've discussed over the past hour long um is that uh, one you really need to invest in a dress form and you can see how easy how it can help you even me putting it on uh this thing you really should invest in a dress form um second invest in making the proper making tools for your corset um or buy a proper corset one of those two. Um, three, make sure that you're having the cage and that you are, if you're going to be making the cage that you do spend the money on, like hoops, um, the hoop steel, things like that. You can thrift and get the bag really cheap and all the other fabric, but the steel is what's going to make it work. Um, I want to say if you're making your whole ball gown from scratch, you're, or at least for me, like the longest part is going to be the petticoat. 
So depending on how you make it and depending on the type of style you make it, whether it's here, whether it's with the godets, whether it's just the ruffles here, it can take you a minute. So just make sure that you're playing your time wisely and that you're not being stressed. I think the petticoat, most of my petticoats for me take like a week or two to make um, and they really do eat up in my time. Like the easiest time I have is usually the skirts because most of the skirts are circle skirts essentially um, and you can just add the bowstrings to them afterwards and the bodices don't take that much longer either because they're bodices, they're not anything new. Um, but yeah, uh, I do want to do like a bonus tips and trick, um, which I get sometimes online of how do I travel to cons with these big ball gowns. Um, the answer is um, vacuum seal. I vacuum seal everything at this point. Um, but you can vacuum seal the petticoat as well as you can vacuum seal this entire dress and it will fit in your suitcase as it needs to be. And the cage is bendable. It's So I just kind of bend it into the suitcase and it just kind of falls in. You can also do zip ties just so it stays in and that's really the easiest way to travel with a ball gown and things like that. Um, yeah. Yeah, vacuum seal is the best way to go. And then when you do get to your hotel room, um, if you could just like, just open it, take it out and let it out, out like a day before so it can be like regain its food. Um, to store your petticoats um, inside out, hanging in your closet, prefer uh, preferably not crushed because um, you can lose the life of a petticoat over time if it's just like in a crushable um, area. So try to like, if you can, have a place where you can flip it inside out um, and then just store it in a lock, in a closet if you have the availability of storage. If you do vacuum seal them, then it is what it is. Um, it just might, it lessens the life of your petticoat. So yeah, that's it. So I'm glad, I hope you guys learned something today. Um, if I have any edits, maybe I'll make something else, like I'll just talk over, a voice over talk. But I hope you guys learned something today. Um, I know that it can be, don't be daunting by your ball gown making. Anyway, can make a ball gown. It just takes time and effort and um, a little bit of research into what you're doing. Um, so yeah, thanks for watching and I hope you guys are staying safe and bye-bye.